You are going to listen to a conversation between two people, a customer and a representative of a company which rents cars. There are three alternative answers, A, B and C, for each question. Decide which alternative is the most suitable answer and circle the appropriate letter. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Now the test will begin. Remember, you will hear the recording only once, so answer the questions as you listen. Now listen to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 1 to 6. Thank you for calling Carline. So that we can best help you, can you please press the star button on your phone now? Thank you. Now choose one of the following four options by pressing the buttons on your telephone. Press 1 if you would like to make a car reservation. Press 2 if you would like to talk to someone about a car reservation. Press 3 if you would... Please hold while we put you through to one of our assistants. Good morning, Melanie speaking. How can I help you? My name is Mr. Maxine, and I booked a car several days ago to be picked up from Heathrow Airport in London, and I'd like to change the booking. I see. Have you got a reference? Yes, I have it here somewhere on a piece of paper. Uh, ah, here it is. It's A for Alpha, C for Charlie, F for Foxtrot, Y for... Yeah. Yes. The number of 15, uh, 1, 5, A for Alpha, and G for Go. Let's see. Can I just check that? A, C, F, Y, 15, A, G. Yes. Mr. John Maxine. Yes, that's it. OK, so how can I help you? I booked a car for three days from this Friday at 6 p.m. to Monday at 6 p.m. Yes, a manual. I'd like to change it for a larger car and an automatic rather than a manual. And I'd also like to book it for five rather than three days. OK, let's have a look. Mm, we have an estate which is automatic. Yes, that would be perfect. There is a difference in price, though. For the extra two days? Yes, but also for the size of the car. The estate is £15 pounds more expensive per day than the saloon car you have already booked. OK. And how much extra is it altogether, then? Um, that makes it an extra £165. Pounds. Hmm. It seems rather expensive. Uh, the last time I hired one, it wasn't so much. When was that? Um, several weeks ago. I see. Before the speakers continue their conversation, look at questions 7 to 10. As you listen to the rest of the dialogue, complete the numbered spaces 7 to 10. Well, it's basically because the rates change daily according to the cars available. The estate is the last automatic we have for hire for that period. 
We have a manual estate, which is cheaper. If that would help. No, it has to be an automatic. Okay. Shall I debit your card for the extra one hundred and sixty-five pounds? Is it possible for me to pay the extra in cash when I pick up the car at the airport? I'm afraid that isn't possible, as there are no facilities for handling cash at that time of the day. <sighs> that seems odd. It's because the money can't be banked in the evening, and for security reasons, no cash is held on the premises. Okay, you can debit my card. You'll have to give the number to me again. Isn't it logged on the screen? For security reasons, it doesn't come up on the screen when we look at the booking. Any changes, and it has to be entered again. I see. It's three double four five double nine double one. Three double four five double nine double one. Double four two five. Double four two five. Double seven five zero. Double seven five zero. Okay, that has now been authorized. Shall we send the receipt to your Park Vale address? Yes,、uh, number forty. Is there anything else I can help you with, Mister Maxine? No, nothing else, thank you. Have a nice trip. Thank you. Goodbye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You'll hear a lecturer talking to students about the ozone layer and CFCs. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to seventeen. Now, listen carefully and answer questions eleven to seventeen. Today, it is well known that CFCs or chlorofluorocarbons can do immense damage to the ozone layer, which protects the Earth from harmful radiation from the sun. However, it was as recently as the mid nineteen seventies when the connection between CFCs and ozone layer destruction was first established. The story starts back in 1957, when James Lovelock invented the electron capture detector. This is a machine that can detect very small amounts of a chemical compound in the atmosphere. Indeed, using the machine, it was Lovelock who was the first person to detect the widespread presence of CFCs in the Earth's atmosphere. In 1973, Lovelock, on a research trip which he'd funded himself. Measured the amount of CFCs in the atmosphere in the Arctic and in Antarctica, but unfortunately came to the wrong conclusion that CFCs are not harmful to the environment. Following on from this work, though, in 1974, Sherry Rowland and Mario Molina published the very first scientific paper on the connection between CFCs and ozone depletion. This quickly prompted the world's first ban on the use of CFCs. Which was enacted in 1975 by the U.S. state of Oregon. Further bans followed. In 1978, the United States and several European countries banned the use of CFCs in spray cans. CFCs were still allowed to be used, though, for refrigeration and in solvents. It was in the mid-1980s that scientists in Antarctica observed a huge depletion in the ozone layer above them. Often called the hole in the ozone layer, 
This led, in 1987, to the signing of the Montreal Protocol, which called for further reductions in the production and use of CFCs, and then, two years later, to a European Union agreement to ban the production of all CFCs by the end of the century. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. So why exactly are CFCs so harmful? One of the reasons CFCs were so popular in the production of solvents and refrigeration coolants is that they are unreactive. That is, they don't react easily or at all with other chemical compounds. It's this property, however, that also makes them dangerous. Because they are unreactive, it's very difficult for them to be broken down. This gives them a long lifespan more than 100 years in some cases, and allows them to rise into the upper levels of the atmosphere, the stratosphere, unchanged. There, ultraviolet radiation from the sun starts to break them down, freeing the chlorine atoms from the CFCs. It's this chlorine that helps destroy the ozone there. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You are going to hear a conversation between an interviewer and a professor. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen to the tape and answer questions 21 to 26. Today I'm here with Professor Nitik, who is our new university president. He has been a professor for 20 years and teaches many of the best classes on campus. I know many of you have had him as a teacher and know of his brilliance. Good morning, Professor Nitik. Thank you for stopping by the student station. Thank you for having me here. It is always great to get to meet many of the students who are involved with our school. I haven't been here since two years ago. Yes, I remember at that time you were still teaching every semester. Two years later, you are only teaching every once in a while. But it seems like you are still always busy. The administration world is just as busy as the teaching world for you. How do you stay in touch with the university, even with the change in your everyday duties? I try to stay in touch with what is popular with the university students. I usually spend time with as many students as I can. They usually give me insight into what the new concerns and beliefs are for the new generation. On top of that, I try to be as youthful as I can. I consider myself to be youthful, at least for my age. So I always have a good time and try to stay young. I try my best to not just be a teacher, but also participate in university life. Interesting. So, are you still doing lots of academic work, or are you mostly concentrating on administrative affairs? Well, I mostly do administrative affairs now, but that doesn't mean that I still don't have a very deep interest in academic matters. I often visit other campuses around the world and meet other professors in my field. I learn the most by travelling and seeing the different places of the world and the different fields of thought. I even did a television programme last month in Manchester. Will you be on television any time soon then? Well, 
You can call the television station and see if I will be on television any time soon. Maybe I will be on the news report. I don't think it is really that significant, though. Oh, really? That sounds great. I will remember to look out for you. Let's move on. With all your busy travelling recently, how do you find time for your personal life? I try to keep my university life separate from my personal life. Sometimes it's hard to find time to just take my wife and three kids out for a family dinner, but usually we all manage to get together every few days. I'm taking a few weeks off next month to take my family down to South America to Brazil for a few days. I can't wait to just sit on the beach. Wow, that sounds like a wonderful trip, Professor Nitik. Could you tell the audience a little about what goes on in an average day of a university administrator? <laughs> An average day? Oh, I don't think there is such thing as an average day for me. The last few weeks I've been travelling all the time. I can be in Los Angeles in the morning and in New York by the afternoon, and back to Los Angeles by the evening. Sometimes I will spend the whole week at a new university, showing the new administrators the ins and outs of running a university. Sometimes I can spend the whole day in the office on the phone. So there really is no average day for me. I guess that is because I do so many different tasks. Sorry to let all the viewers down, but that is the plain truth. Now look at questions twenty-seven to thirty. Now listen to the tape and answer questions twenty-seven to thirty. Well, I guess I can sum it up for them. You are a busy man. That is probably a good description. So, are there any immediate plans for the coming few weeks? Well, I'm in Los Angeles for the next two days, and then I fly to Colorado to meet a new prospective professor for our university. I will be in Colorado for about a week. Then I go to Japan for the next ten days to meet with our university branch in Japan about record sales there. After that, I return to Los Angeles for a week, just in time for the graduation of the class of two thousand and one. There you have it, my next month's schedule. Thank you very much, Professor Nitik. I always enjoy having you on our show. We hope to have you back on our show next time. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a part of a lecture about learning and bilingualism. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty, on pages forty-four and forty-five. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty.
When we look at theories of education and learning, we see a constant shifting of views as established theories are questioned and refined or even replaced, and we can see this very clearly in the way that attitudes towards bilingualism have changed. Let's start with a definition of bilingualism, and for our purposes today, we can say it's the ability to communicate with the same degree of proficiency in at least two languages. Now, in practical terms, this might seem like a good thing, something we'd all like to be able to do. However, early research done with children in the USA in fact suggested that being bilingual interfered in some way with learning and with the development of their mental processes. And so in those days, bilingualism was regarded as something to be avoided and parents were encouraged to bring their children up as monolingual, just speaking one language. But this research, which took place in the early part of the 20th century, is now regarded as unsound for various reasons, mainly because it didn't take into account other factors, such as the children's social and economic backgrounds. Now, in our last lecture, we were looking at some of the research that's been done into the way children learn, into their cognitive development, and in fact we believe now that the relationship between bilingualism and cognitive development is actually a positive one. It turns out that cognitive skills such as problem solving, which don't seem at first glance to have anything to do with how many languages you speak, are better among bilingual children than monolingual ones. And quite recently, there's been some very interesting work done by Ellen Bialystok at York University in Canada. She's been doing various studies on the effects of bilingualism, and her findings provide some evidence that they might apply to adults as well. They're not just restricted to children. So how do you go about investigating something like this? Well... Dr Bialystok used groups of monolingual and bilingual subjects aged from 30 right up to 88. For one experiment, she used a computer program which displayed either a red or a blue square on the screen. The coloured square could come up on either the left hand or the right hand side of the screen. If the square was blue, the subject had to press the left shift key on the keyboard and if the square was red, they had to press the right shift key. So they didn't have to react at all to the actual position of the square on the screen, just to the colour they saw. And she measured the subject's reaction times by recording how long it took them to press the shift key and how often they got it right. What she was particularly interested in was whether it took the subject longer to react when a square lit up on one side of the screen, say the left, and the subject had to press the shift key on the right-hand side. She'd expected that it would take more processing time than if a square lit up on the left and the candidates had to press a left key. This was because of a phenomenon known as the Simon effect, where basically the brain gets a bit confused because of conflicting demands being made on it. In this case, seeing something on the right and having to react on the left. And this causes a person's reaction times to slow down. The results of the experiment showed that the bilingual subjects responded more quickly than the monolingual ones. That was true both when the squares were on the correct side of the screen, so to speak, and even more so when they were not. So bilingual people were better able to deal with the Simon effect than the monolingual ones. So what's the explanation for this? Well, the results of the experiment suggest that bilingual people are better at ignoring information which is irrelevant to the task in hand and just concentrating on what's important. One suggestion given by Dr Bialystok was that it might be because someone who speaks two languages can suppress the activity of parts of the brain when it isn't needed. In particular, the part that processes whichever language isn't being used at that particular time. Well, she then went on to investigate that with a second experiment. But again, the bilingual group performed better. And what was particularly interesting, and this is, I think, why the experiments have received so much publicity, is that in all cases, the performance gap between monolinguals and bilinguals actually increased with age. 
which suggests that bilingualism protects the mind against decline. So in some way, the lifelong experience of managing two languages may prevent some of the negative effects of ageing. So that's a very different story from the early research. So what are the implications of this for education? That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.